Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Dietrich, Associate Director of Membership, and I'd like to welcome you to the Science Behind the Beauty. It is my pleasure to in introduce our presenter, Leah Johnson, PhD, Associate Director of Land Stewardship and Ecology. Leah combines scientific research in plant ecology and ecological restoration with land management. She manages a multidisciplinary team that integrates ecology, plant science, landscape architecture, wildlife biology, and horticulture to steward 750 acres of diverse habitats in a dynamic and urbanized landscape. Under her direction, the Lands Land uh, Stewardship and Ecology Program conducts long-term ecological research in forests, wetlands, riparian corridors, meadows, and land uh, ag and agricultural lands, as well as develops and tests best practices in land stewardship and manages more than 100 acres of public facing native meadows and forests, highlighting the beauty and value of native plants. Today's recorded presentation will be emailed to all attendees. At the end of the presentation, Leah can answer your questions. Please submit them through the questions function. Leah, thank you so much for sharing, for being with us today and sharing your expertise. Thanks, Melissa. So what I'd like to talk with you all about today um, is reading landscapes. And this is a, a practice, a, a skill that can be gained that enriches my experience of the world. And I think it enriches the experience of anyone who learns to do it. Um, as Melissa was saying, I lead the Land Stewardship and Ecology team here at Longwood, where we integrate ecological science for, and adaptive land management for both beauty and biodiversity. And to do that, we need to understand the landscapes that we work with. Um, those landscapes, as Melissa mentioned, uh, are about 750 acres that surround the formal gardens. Um, we have a wide array of different kinds of habitats. Um, and to understand each of them is important for uh, deciding what exactly to do and when. Um, the team that I work with has a variety of different expertise, um, and we do a lot of different kinds of work across the landscape. Uh, one key part of that is ecological science. Um, we engage in long-term ecological research. We have mapped all of our plant communities. That's what that map was that I showed just a second ago. Um, and we are engaged in an ecological baseline study right now so that we can understand effects of change over the long term, both in response to the work that we do and also in terms uh, of responses to broader scale environmental change. We're also testing a variety of techniques um, because humanity has spent many millennia figuring out how to shape ecosystems to suit our needs, how to reassemble them is um, a, a newer practice and very experimental. There's lots to learn. So today I'd like to focus on how we can expand our sense of place and our sense of understanding of the places where we live and work and play um, through observation. And I'd like to point you today to some ways to observe and to some things that you might look for um, clues to the current, the past, and perhaps the future condition of the landscapes around you. So I personally find that um, having learned to identify the life that I see around me and, I, and uh, learning to see patterns in the landscape um, enriches my experience of the world. And I hope that it does for you as well. So if we zoom way out, uh, we can look at our landscapes from uh, a, very, a very broad perspective. And if we do that, um, you know, we notice things that have to do with you know, the density of uh, people and the various transformations that we make to landscapes. Um, we can also, at a very zoomed out perspective, think about 
the places that we live in terms of their ecoregion. And ecoregion is um, an area that has a characteristic uh, vegetation, um, has very uh, characteristic flora and fauna that, that have derived from um, long-term patterns in soil, in climate, um, and a variety of topography, other factors that have shaped there being communities of different types in different places. Um, ecoregions can be defined very broadly and then they can also be defined more specifically um, as you zoom in on a particular location. Um, as you can see, the ecoregions of Pennsylvania are very much related to um, the, the history, the, the deep history of geology in the state. So if we zoom in uh, a bit further, um, we can think about the landscape that we live in in terms of patches. And if you look at this patchwork quilt, um, you might know where your home is. If your home is somewhere in this, uh, in this view, um, you might be able to guess different things about the different places that you're seeing in this patchwork uh, based on color, based on shape. Um, and our landscape um, is made patchy not only by the actions that people take, but also by the fact that resources are not uh, naturally distributed evenly over the face of the planet either. So you have an interaction of um, patches of resources that uh, different creatures might use, uh, different plants might use to grow uh, across the landscape. And then you have an additional layer of, of, um, of patchiness that's created by human activity. So we can look at that, you know, thinking about there are these underlying patterns of soils, there are these, you know, atmospheric patterns of, um, uh, of climate and uh, and then we can take a look at the, at the patch where we are and say, okay, here I am at the edge of a patch, um, or here I am in the middle of something. Are there gradients in the resources that are available to life here? So um, these, the, the, each creature, each plant, each uh, life form of the planet has its needs. Um, and so those, and because those needs are not, or the, the resources for those needs are not distributed evenly across the planet, um, you can often see gradients where you're passing from an area of high availability to low availability of some resource. So um, those, that could be something like in this example, passing from a high light environment into a dark environment. Now the plants that can grow in inside that very dense uh, looks like planted forest there, um, compared to what can grow in an open field, those are going to be different species of plants because light is an important resource. Um, the abruptness of the transition is important to those gradients and to how that shapes what grows. Um, so that might be a very abrupt or hard edge, or it could be a very soft edge where you have gradation um, of natural communities. Uh, these gradients can also, um, this is a like, slightly softer edge than the, than the previous one. Um, a very hard edge would be like pavement and buildings uh, on one side and, and forest on the other, for example. Um, so gradients of moisture are very important also to life. So we thought about the super zoomed out landscape picture. Um, we've zoomed in on ecoregions, we've thought about patchiness, gradients, um, and you can use those perspectives and other clues to start understanding um, what the potential history of, a, of an individual place might be. Um, and there are many clues that we can use to understand history and to also understand current land management practices. So one thing we can look for is evidence of ecological disturbance. So an ecological disturbance is any event that removes plants and or disturbs the soil. Um, uh, ecological disturbance has a lot of different causes and modes of action. So it could be something like a volcanic eruption, a, um, a glacier retreating, a mine, a sand dune forming, or it could be a human activity like clearing a forest or mowing a lawn, 
it's a very small disturbance, but uh, something like one tree falling in the forest is, is a small scale ecological disturbance. And what's important about ecological disturbance here, a river flooding, for example, is that it changes the availability of resources for life. So places to grow, access to nutrients, the light environment. And so uh, it makes some space for, um, for new, new things to grow um, and changes the availability overall. Those, like I was saying, here's one tree falls in a forest. Ecological disturbances can be huge, they can be small. Um, they can be frequent, they can be rare. Um, they also vary in intensity. Urbanization, for example, is one of the more um, long lasting and severe forms of ecological disturbance. And we can watch um, for signs of past disturbance in plant communities that we find now. And I, and I think a uh, so some of my uh, my focus for today is to is to think about when we go out walking in more natural landscapes, um, what signs do we see of past activity? So we can look for indicators of change over time in plant communities after ecological disturbance, and that process of change over change over time after disturbance is called ecological succession, um, and that's it's changed. Uh, in structure, so the physical structure, like is it all short herbaceous plants? Is it a tree? Is it a forest that has multi-layered uh, structure with an understory and shrubs and um, short trees and tall trees? So structure like that and composition, what species are present? So that changes over time following a disturbance. And so you also have changes in species richness and diversity of the functions that those species um, are able to perform ecologically the, the com complex different array of niches and the interactions between species, all of that changes over time. Um, that, this process is also called vegetation dynamics. And the causes of how that plays out uh, over time um, are three important factors. Um, site availability, so is space available to, to live in? Are the resources available to live in or to grow and, um, and thrive and reproduce? And those resources also change over time through the process of ecological succession. Um, so the, which, which resources and how much space are changes over time. Species availability um, is also really important. So after a disturbance, do you have just mineral soil for miles? <laughs> or do you have a seed bank that is full of uh, seeds or that is even full of, um, the soil is full of plants that were maybe damaged but are still alive? Um, that will make a huge difference to what species are there first and then what happens over time. Um, species performance is also very important and that's all about the interactions between species. So um, how those species, uh, the, the traits of those species you know, that, that are inherent to them and then how they interact with each other over, over time. So in the very long run, um, you can go from an environment like the one on the left to the one on the right through that process. Um, Ecological succession has a lot of different possible trajectories though, and what direction um, it takes can depend upon um, all of those factors that I just mentioned. So what species are there, um, what the disturbance was, um, how the species interact. And so we can take an environment like this and we can ask, what happened here? Why did it end up like this? And maybe you've seen an environment that looks like this. This is a common situation along roadsides where you have uh, a few vine species covering uh, all the trees on the edge. So one guess that we might have um, about an environment like this is that we are seeing habitat fragmentation. Um, that, that this is not a large, uh, have, it's not a large area with a really big interior. We're looking at an edge here. We're looking at um, uh, a place where vines, which have evolved in many, many different plant lineages over time, 
the vine growth farm is basically a great way to get lots of reproduction done because if a vine doesn't have to spend a lot of energy on making a really tall stem. It can climb up other plants, uh, grow lots of leaves, make lots of flowers, make lots of fruit. Um, and so where you see a lot of vines, you're looking at an edge and you're probably in, in our region looking at a pretty small patch of forest or even just a line of forest. And um, that's really important to the species that can live there. So for example, many forest interior dwelling creatures need bigger patches of forest to get all the resources they need. When you see an environment like this, and this might be familiar to you if you've been to Longwood, um, you can look at an environment like this this is an early successional environment. Um, so that means if you're, you're, you're not seeing trees, we're in a temperate zone where trees tend to win unless the soil is totally inhospitable to them or there's very frequent disturbance, um, trees are going to win. So when you find a very open space like this that does not have a lot of trees, you know that there has been ecological disturbance. Um, and if it's a meadow, it's a, probably some kind of management. So uh, for example, at Longwood, uh, we burn our meadow garden about somewhere between every one and three years. Most of the meadow garden is on a three-year rotation. Um, and we do that to keep it from becoming a forest so that it we maintain that meadow habitat. Um, other interesting clues that you might look for when you're out and about walking um, that have to do with fire. You can look for scars and charring on the uphill side of trees. Um, this happens because uh, trees in a trees on a hill will have uh, accumulation of leaf litter on the uphill side, and then when there's a fire, the fire becomes hotter on the uphill side and can damage the trunk uh, because of that accumulated kindling right at the base. And <laughs> please enjoy my uh, drew it with a mouse uh, drawings here. Um, you can also ask yourself as you're wandering around. Uh, you might find something like this in the woods where you see a, um, a kind of a long mounded structure, maybe with trees growing on it. Um, and that might be the sign of, a, of an old agricultural boundary and especially of a crop field. Um, if the, um, if the, if the, the long uh, mound of rocks has both large and small rocks in it, it's more likely to have been an agricultural field with plowing because if you, um, when, when uh, this region uh, was initially uh, cleared during the European settlement period, people um, leveled the ground and they also took the big rocks out of the fields that they were plowing and those rocks became the boundaries of fields. And in areas where plowing was the regular, um, was the regular use of the land, then small rocks would also be taken out on an annual basis as they came to the surface due to freeze-thaw cycles. If you find uh, a long row of rocks uh, in, in a mound that doesn't have those small rocks, it might have been the boundary of um, a, uh, a pasture or, a, or other land use uh, that, that wasn't plowing because they wouldn't bother to take all those small rocks out. When you're walking in the woods, you may also find areas where you, where you see smooth, even terrain in an area that's otherwise uneven. That's a, that's a good sign that there was a plowed crop field there as well. This is something that I really enjoy when I find this. I think a lot of people do. Um, you, you will sometimes find a tree that looks like it was grown out in the open. It's got like a heavy spherical crown, especially oaks and maples. I have this very rounded open crown um, and they'll be surrounded by skinnier, taller trees um, that, are, that are much thinner in diameter and that have a, a long trunk before they have um, uh, branching up towards the top. I think these that I drew here are probably tulip trees given the shape. <laughs> They're also an important early um, early successional forest tree. Uh, they tend to come in, their seeds are wind dispersed, so they come into open areas very quickly um, and they grow very tall very fast. Um, another interesting sign of land history is when you find multi-trunk trees. Um, oaks are very good at resprouting when they are cut, for example. Um, so where, when you find multiple trunk trees, um, one in interesting thing 
that you can do is you can get a you can make a guesstimate of uh, how old uh, or what the original size of the of the trees might have been uh, by looking about a third of the way into each of those stems uh, because the 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 re-sprouts tend to grow on the edge of the old stump um, and you can then guess the the size of the original trunk. Another thing that you might find stumps. Now, when you find a stump, it might be that the tree just fell over. But if the, if the stump is more or less flat, uh, and if the tree is missing, that means somebody probably used it for something <laughs> and took it away. So um, especially if it's a really big tree and it's missing. Other, um, other signs you can look for in the woods. Look for scars at the base of the trees that face each other about a road width apart. Um, you might be looking at, the, at, an, at an old road and you'll often see a, um, once you find that, you may find more in a row and you may also find that sort of flattened topography um, indicating a road. Sometimes it's more obvious than others. Um, here's that flattened topography. So uh, in this, this is a fairly obvious road cut at this point, but you can imagine that, you know, in a hundred years, it might not be quite as obvious that this was once a road, but you can see that there's a, a, a natural topography and then there's a cut and flat area. Um, and that's the typical topography of a, an old road. Um, another thing you may encounter are trees that have trunks, that look like this. And when you find a whole bunch of them like this, um, that's an indicator of something that happened in the past. Um, these elbows uh, are generally a sign of some kind of uh, weather event that flattened those trees when they were young. Um, in colder areas, that can happen with heavy snowpack. Um, and in other areas, it might be that those trees um, had something fall on them or were knocked down by some kind of major storm. Uh, other things that happen in storms. Uh, when you find a trunk that has been snapped higher up and is splintered like this, uh, this is much more likely the sign of uh, a, a strong windstorm. Um, when you find the tops of trees snapped off uh, and piled up like this. Uh, when you find a bunch of trees that are laying down and they're all laying down in the same direction, um, that is called a blowdown. Um, and that's, you know, the, the sign of a very strong um, weather event, like a hurricane or a tornado. Um, another common uh, occurrence in, in large storms uh, is root tipping. Um, this is a beech tree, I believe, that I'm standing here underneath, <laughs> um, and which, which tend to have these very very wide root tips when they fall over if it's a big one. Um, uh, this is a very actually important feature of forests. And there are a lot of forest creatures that really depend on the topography and the, the redistribution of resources of this very small ecological disturbance. Um, root tips like the one that I was standing in the puddle of in the last photo um, are a place where you where you will find vernal pools. Now the one on the left here, um, which is in woods at Longwood, um, this one is formed by soil conditions, uh, but smaller vernal pools are also formed uh, by root tips. And, and this is where frogs go to breed. Um, the neat thing about vernal pools is that they are not full of water all year, uh, vernal meaning spring. Um, so a vernal pool will be full of water in the winter time when all of those plants have no leaves. Uh, the, when the trees don't have leaves, they are not pulling water out of the ground uh, through their roots. And so the water table rises. When the, the trees begin pulling water out of the ground again through, their, um, through the process of photosynthesis, uh, then the ground dries and that, ti that timing is very good for frogs because the develop the frogs lay their eggs in these vernal pools, the tadpoles develop, they turn into small frogs, and they are able to leave around the time that the pond dries up 
Uh, and meanwhile, all of those tadpoles have managed to live a fish-free life up to that point because fish generally don't live in these uh, places that are dry during most, much of the year. Um, and so the tadpoles don't get eaten by fish. They may get eaten by other frogs, but not fish. Um, so in other places, um, we might see something like this. Um, you can look for signs of ecological disturbance and you can also look for signs of very little ecological disturbance. Um, so in a place like the one shown here, you're actually looking at something old. And there are a lot of signs that you can look for um, for old forests. And in the uh, mid-Atlantic region, there are often small patches uh, that are older surrounded by places that are younger. And so you can stumble into these special spots when you're out walking. Um, so some things to look for. Old forest, uh, the soil, the, the, the soil surface, the topography tends to be really lumpy. And that's because over a very long period of time, trees have tipped over and created that, um, the pit where you have the vernal pools, the mound of soil that, that is next to it from the root of the tree. And over time, the tree decomposes in your left with a hollow and a hummock, uh, a pillow and a cradle. There are lots of different ways to talk about it, but old forests are lumpy. Um, an, an interesting sign of an older forest uh, and often of a forest in good condition is it's really hard to walk through. Um, to just go straight across it is difficult because there are, you know, there's, there are logs, there are lumps. Um, so it's lumpy. Um, old trees, also lumpy. <laughs> um, they, they tend to have unique and irregular morphologies. So, you know, when you see an old tree, you know that there are a lot of stories there. There are many storms that have been survived. Um, there are many creatures that have lived in that tree over time. Uh, another clue is to look at the bark of the trees. Um, this is red maple, both of these pictures. Uh, on the left is what you might be more accustomed to red maple looking like. Um, red maple gets used as a street tree and a parking lot tree. It's one of our very broad range uh, native plants. It's got one of the biggest ranges of any species in a tree in Eastern North America. It tolerates a lot of different conditions. And so we use it a lot, um, which is great. It is often young and looks kind of like an elephant leg. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as smooth as a beech tree, but um, over time it develops cracks and fissures. Um, and on the right is an older tree uh, of the same species. Uh, there are di bark differences between young and 100 year old trees, and then really old trees, like a 300 year old tree, uh, will have different bark patterns still because as the, the tree grows, um, the, the bark uh, splits and cracks in, in different patterns over time, having to do with how quickly the circumference is increasing. And each, there are different species of trees have different patterns. If you want to get into bark, it's actually a really interesting, um, interesting uh, area of tree ID. Um, there's a book called Bark you could look at that has lots of good pictures. Um, Old forests also have some an interesting feature, and this is not from our ecosystem, but this is a, a sort of more extreme example of something that you'll see here, usually with smaller relief. Um, what's called stilt rooting. You'll see, you'll find a, a tree that looks like it's up on stilts, and that happens because old trees are uh, dead wood is really important as a source of nutrients and is a good place to grow. Really great soil is formed out of dead wood. So when a tree falls down, young trees often get started on top of it uh, in the soil that develops as it decomposes. And then as the tree underneath decomposes, then the, that tree that has grown on top sometimes ends up looking as if it's sort of standing up on stilts. And the tree that is decomposing is called a nurse log. Dead wood is also a really good indicator of ecological function. Um, so dead wood is super important to forest ecosystems in general um, because it is really where the action is <laughs> in terms of nutrients and uh, the, the various processes of ecological recycling that move 
um, nutrients through our entire system. And so uh, dead wood, the bigger, the better, uh, and the more diverse in size, laying down, standing up, um, all of all of the um, different kinds of dead wood post life, um, the decomposing fungi, the, the, the many um, insects that are able to decompose wood and then the tunnels that they make and other things live in there. And then there's a whole food web uh, that, that's built around dead wood. So dead wood can be seen as an indicator of ecological potential. And so we can look at our, um, our landscapes from a very broad perspective to understand where we are. Um, we can understand the history, the geology, the soils, the climate. Um, we can look for clues to past land use, uh, to current land use. And then we can also think about what we're seeing as an indicator of what could be. Um, I'm a fan of dead wood, as you probably have gathered <laughs> around here. It's a very good indicator of ecological potential. Um, there are lots of other um, indicators of current uh, biological diversity and also of future potential. By knowing what we find around us, then we can imagine how we might be able to help. Um, so we can befriend biodiversity. Um, we can learn to understand the things around us. Uh, these are uh, images from the Longwood iNaturalist project. Um, so if you make any observations using the app iNaturalist while you are on Longwood property, we will get to see them. So please do uh, when you are visiting us. We are always excited to understand more about the biodiversity that we have and we really appreciate everyone's observations. Learning to identify the creatures that you see around you, I think just, it, it's like you get to have more friends. <laughs> And then, and then when you travel to places that you've never been, you get to look around you and say, okay, I don't know you, but I think I know your cousin. And then that helps you to understand new places as well. It also helps us to um, understand how things are connected and understanding how things are connected. If you know that this is a goldfinch and you know that goldfinches really like to eat, say the seed, seeds of thistles, uh, and other asters, then you might know that you could plant those species in your uh, in the area that you have control over, and that you could maybe invite some goldfinches into your world. If you know that monarch butterflies really love milkweeds, you can plant milkweeds, like this butterfly milkweed, uh, to support mul uh, monarch butterflies uh, on their journey across the world, or at least North America. <laughs> um, you can also um, support biodiversity that is not yet in, in the place where you are um, by providing what it needs. Um, if you find a lady slipper orchid, you're probably happy. <laughs> If you like orchids, anyway, lots of people like orchids. Uh, if you if you find a lady slipper orchid, you can find you can you know that you are in a place that has other kinds of biodiversity as well because a, a lady slipper orchid needs a soil that is basically a dead tree that has decomposed. So if if you're in a place that has that kind of soil, which is probably in a forest because um, they don't tend to grow it well. We won't go into all the details. So you're, you're in a forest, you, you see a ladies of Barker, you can also, you know that you're going to also have lots of other kinds of biodiversity that you might not be able to see in the soil and surrounding you um, because you know what that plant needs. Uh, you're, you might be in a place that has forest interior nesting birds, right? Because you are in a place that has that, uh, that soil that's made of decomposed wood you probably also have birds that nest in cavities in dead trees like pileated woodpeckers and screech owls, which sometimes also come and live in our wood duck boxes here in Longwood, like the one with the little fuzzy chicks there. Um, you might also have oven birds, which are forest nesting birds that use, uh, that build nests on the forest floor. And if you see these um, 
if you see forest interior nesting birds, then you probably know that you're in a larger patch of forest because these species need a, a greater amount of, of the things that a forest provides that can be provided by trees in lawn or, or trees in a park-like setting. Also knowing the species that, that you see in, um, in your travels through the world, um, helps you to understand how things are connected. So if you know what a monarch butterfly looks like, then you know that you are, when you, when you see a monarch butterfly, you are seeing an individual that is part of a species that has this connection between um, North America, uh, across North America, uh, and does this amazing migration. Um, and that the habitat that's being provided right where you are is key to that, the ongoing survival of that species. Same with, with an oven bird. Learning to um, see patterns and to, to identify the species that you see around you also changes your feeling for cycles and for time. Um, this is one of the hidden pleasures of uh, learning to read the landscape and to understand the life and diversity around you. Um, it gives you the feeling of anticipation for spring ephemerals. I'm starting to feel this right now <laughs> because we're in February. Um, we have amazing uh, spring ephemeral wildflowers uh, in, our, in our forest here. Um, you get to have that anticipation and you also get to know when to go look um, so that you can have those experiences. You get to um, see creatures in different stages of their lives and understand that the caterpillar you're seeing now is going to be a monarch butterfly later, which brings its own sort of pleasure. Um, all of these indicators of ecological potential um, are, are also places where one can help uh, and where one can contribute to biodiversity. And if you're interested in some tools for how to apply this to a home landscape, which a lot of people are. I always get lots of questions about that. Um, one place that you can go look is the Landscape for Life um, website and curriculum. Um, this is uh, something that grew out of the Sustainable Sites Initiative. Um, and you can use the tools of uh, this website to start um, analyzing the, the place where you live or a place that you are in charge of uh, to to look at what the resources that you have are and what the potential might be for supporting biodiversity at home. So <laughs> we, we combine all of these sort of perspectives um, in the land stewardship and ecology program here at Longwood and apply them to the, to the natural lands that surround our formal gardens. Um, places you can go at Longwood if you would like to um, ponder the landscape. Um, I really recommend winter as a time to look at landscapes because you can see, um, especially in forests, you can see right through the trees. Uh, it's really, um, it, it see your landscape in every season, but it, winter is, is really good for um, seeing the shape of the land among other things. So the meadow garden, um, we will be preparing for our spring burn pretty soon, coming up in March. Um, the forest walk, which is an older forest, um, and the lookout loft from, from which you can view it. Uh, and the Webb Farmhouse is a, actually a, if you have not been in, is a small museum about the history of the land. So for more reading, uh, if you're interested in this sort of landscape detective stuff, um, I, I can recommend these two books. Uh, reading the Forest and Landscape by Tom Wessels. Uh, is, is a narrative book that has lots of, of stories. It's based in, uh, in the ecology and the history of New England, but many of the same processes are rele relevant to the Mid-Atlantic. Um, Forest Forensics is like the picture field guide version of that book. Um, and of course, uh, Longwood's continuing education programs have an increasing number of uh, programs related to native plants and landscapes that you can check out. So with that, uh, thank you for listening. And I hope that some little piece of what I've talked about today sticks in your mind and that you see something interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Leah.
Um, we actually have a few questions and hopefully a few people will add to the list. Um, a question about having a, uh, is it healthy for a tree to have lots of moss on its trunk? Is that uh, something we should be concerned about? I suppose it depends on what the tree looks like. <laughs> moss is not inherently uh, problematic, uh, but I am not an arborist. <laughs> so um, I, you know, in a, in a moister environment where the conditions are right, you might have more moss. We have another question and it really centers about um, uh, lantern flies. And thinking about, yes, it's wonderful to have dying trees <laughs> in that land, but are they worried? They are worried about um, lantern flies using that as a hiding, hiding spot or a growing location. Is that something that you're familiar with or have seen? So the spotted lantern fly um, makes use of the tree of heaven as its favorite host plant. It also um, does eat some of our native trees as well, um, but it uses the trees for food um, and, it, and it uses live trees. So um, in terms of dead trees and lantern flies, the, um, uh, they're not going to be using it for food. They could potentially lay eggs on a dead tree. Um, their eggs look like kind of a smudge of mud. They're really kind of hard to find and they lay eggs on everything. They lay eggs on cars. That's one of the, one of the ways that people think they have traveled around. Um, they'll lay them on buildings. So there, there are, I wouldn't say that dead trees are more likely to have lanternfly eggs on them than other trees. And obviously, you know, um, <laughs> dead wood is nice, but you know, as long as it's not going to harm anyone. Um, you know, we do we do manage our dead wood near our paths and roads and that kind of thing so that we don't have, you know, things are going to fall over on anyone. Thank you. We have another question about managing deer population. And is that something that Longwood looks at? Yes, we have an active deer management uh, program uh, to try to keep our deer herds at a sustainable level so that we actually have regeneration of trees in our forests. Um, as well as keeping them from eating everything. <laughs> we have another question about chestnut trees in our forest. Do you, are you still seeing signs of chestnut trees growing in, in our area? Well, I mean, I have seen some chestnut trees. <laughs> Most chestnut trees that you're going to find if you're out and about walking are um, either going to be root sprouts off of trees that died long ago, um, uh, but didn't quite die. And, and often you'll, you'll find young, you know, what looked like a young tree, but it's actually a very old tree because it's growing on the old rootstock and they tend to not live very long before they get killed back again. And then often they will re-sprout. So you, you'll find these kind of tenacious sprouts off of roots. Um, there are some uh, native species like the Allegheny chinkapin that are similar looking that might look like a chestnut that you might find out there. Um, there are some efforts uh, by the American Chestnut Foundation and others uh, to, to, um, to basically create new stock of, uh, of American chestnuts. Uh, American Chestnut Foundation has been, uh, has been back crossing with Chinese chestnut that is uh, resistant, um, not entirely uh, Im immune to it, but, but that is more resistant to the chestnut blight. And so uh, we actually have some individuals uh, that are back crosses, experimental back crosses that, that we have planted out here and we're watching them to see how they do. Um, and basically that's a multi-tree generational project that uh, they hope to uh, breed some resistant chestnuts over the very long term. Wonderful. We have another question about mistletoe. Is this any indication of a weakened tree? So mistletoe, it, well, there are many species of mistletoe. Uh, mistletoe uh, is a, just like a fascinating group of plants. <laughs> um, uh, they, they actually, uh, they evolved from a plant that was more of a root parasite. 
and then they they have ended up in the branches. Um, so, but mistletoe um, is not necessarily a sign of a weakened tree. Um, they, uh, if you wanted to intentionally grow mistletoe, I wouldn't do it on a very small tree. Um, but because they can, uh, they can weaken the branches beyond the point of, of, of infection by the mistletoe. Um, but in general, they're just making a freeloading living off of the tree. Thank you. A uh, burning longwood meadow, does it actually kill younger trees or do you still have to cut the tree down because the, uh, the burning uh, isn't sufficient enough? Well, it depends on how long you wait. Uh, so this is why we do it every one to three years. So the, the really small trees are prevented from getting bigger by burning. Uh, if you wait longer than that, you might also have to go in there with some loppers or something. Aside from the prescribed meadow burn, uh, what are some other recommended practices for the management of invasive and non-native species across like maybe hedgerows, fields, uh, of an older farm? Well, that is my, it's one of my favorite areas of research. <laughs> we actually have a bunch of research going on about, on that. And we, you know, we test a bunch of different techniques. So I think the short answer to that question is it depends on what species you're managing because um, each invasive species is different and special. <laughs> <laughs> they each have uh, their timing and their growth form. Um, so I think the, the first key is to know what you're handling um, and, to, and to then look into what the best practices are. Um, and there are usually different practices that you, that you can use. Some of them might be more labor intensive. Uh, if you're uh, open to using herbicides, that's like a different, a different timing and a different group of techniques. So um, you can figure out what the good mix is for you of techniques that you like, that, that you prefer, and uh, what is effective for that species. Great, thank you. Uh, we had another uh, member ask about major impacts of beavers creating dead trees. Um, and then of course, it's then creating more flooding and other problems, but also potentially have some advantages. Do you have any thoughts about uh, beaver impact? Beavers. Beavers are so important. I mean, it, it's like, it's almost, it's, it's really difficult to imagine what the, the sort of pre-European river systems of North America looked like, because they were full of beavers. And um, beavers create ponds, uh, and they also change the flow of rivers. And the way it, we talked about ecological disturbance earlier, um, you know, they, they create uh, whole, you know, wetland ecosystems uh, that are otherwise not present. That doesn't play well with human infrastructure often. And we tend to like to build our infrastructure right up to and uh, including stream systems. So there is, you know, in the in the modern world, there is always a tension between, you know, the, those uh, ecological values that beavers can bring and whether or not there's enough room for them in the place where they have just appeared. Thank you. Another question about um, about our meadow and how the prevention of aggressive perennials from dominating. The minnow. Is there anything outside of your prescribed burns that really take care of very aggressive perennials? Well, we're kind of fighting perennials with perennials. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are things we don't particularly love, like multiflora rose, for example. Um, that, that we uh, we try to remove, um, and we you know we do that with the prescribed burning, but we also go after it individually, um, and you know you can you can again the, each each species has its own uh, its own timing. Timing is actually something people don't think about a lot very much, or often don't think about very often in in terms of uh, of management of uh, invasive species, but each of them has like a, a vulnerable time when, when it's uh, also more practical for people to, to work on things. Um, we have tools like a thing called a weed wrench, <laughs> which is like a, a big lever with a grabber on it, basically, that helps you to take out, you know, 
of something like a multi-flora rose, a small sh like shrubs and small trees, that kind of thing. Um, but we, you know, a lot of what our meadow is is perennials. It's perennial grasses, perennial herbs, and so having those perennial species um, uh, helps them to hold space against those uh, other species coming in. Um, I believe we are down to our very last question. So um, as you and your team has been reviewing the landscape here at Longwood, was there anything that you found that you were surprised by that you just weren't expecting as you were doing all of your mapping? I would say there, there are kind of two kinds of surprises. Uh, one is Longwood, like many properties in uh, that have a long history, has all kinds of all kinds of infrastructure that is sort of hidden by natural areas now. So you know, finding oh over here there's a tile drain, and you know over here there was a house. Okay, that's why there's a patch that looks funny there. You know, what, that's why there's a bunch of daylilies in that one spot in the middle of the meadow because there used to be a house there. Um, that kind of thing. So those kinds of surprises, and then there's um, you know just the there is so many like just delightful surprises. <laughs> You know, uh, we worked with the Natural Heritage Program, uh, uh, the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program um, at Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, uh, and it, it was really fun to, um, you know, to work with them to then match our plant communities with the natural, Pencil natural communities of Pennsylvania and to find that we have some fairly unique habitats, uh, we have some, some places that are really special. That's fantastic. And I'm sure we will start to learn more about those places as time goes on and your research uh, is further along. But uh, again, thank you, Leah, for sharing your passion with our members. Like I mentioned before, this recording will be shared with all attendees so you can share it with other loved ones or just watch it again. And I would like to thank you, our members, for not only supporting uh, our gardens, which preserves our rich legacy, but it also helps us to continue to inspire many, many generations to come. So we hope that you visit us often. We hope you come and see the meadow garden and walk the grounds a bit and kind of take a look at things with maybe fresh eyes. But until we see each other again, thank you.